Hey Internet, welcome to Worldview Everlasting, your favorite YouTube addiction. And on this week's Ask the Pastor, we got a question about holy or maybe not so holy baptism. Uh, well, it's holy, yeah, definitely. And so you definitely want to stick around. Uh -oh, uh -oh, uh -oh. Email. All right, so our question from a viewer this week is, Hey, we TV. my mother just showed me an article from a 2002 newspaper trying to explain why infant baptism is not scriptural. The author used both Romans 116 and Acts 238 to back up the argument. I need a second opinion. More cowbell! I would agree with that, and I'd say you maybe shouldn't be getting your theology from the newspaper, although it's not surprising because these are not new arguments at all. The Baptists have been around for quite a while, although not with all the history of the church, which which is kind of interesting in its own right, but they certainly have a bug in their craw about infant baptism and how it's just like the most unbiblical thing in the world. In fact, if you visit a lot of different Baptist churches, you might find it's the only thing they agree about. I got some good Baptist friends. I don't hate them or anything like that, but I think they're pretty wrong on the issue. Now, as I answer your question about Romans chapter one and Acts chapter two, I want to start with a little bit of a warning. There's a danger here, and it's a thing that rationalists Americans tend to do a lot. Kind of the, the reason-oriented understanding of Scripture has a habit to pit Scripture against Scripture rather than using the Scriptures to understand the Scriptures. Danger, Will Robinson. That is, if you can think of the Scriptures as being like a whole bunch of little tiny boxes and you're labeling each one of these boxes as a doctrine or an idea, a truth that God has given, you know, what happens when you got this verse goes here and this verse goes here and this goes verse here, this, <laughs> this goes verse here, yeah, right. <laughs> And this verse goes here, and this verse doesn't have a box, right? Now, do you pit this verse against those scriptures? Because it's all working so far right here, but this verse doesn't fit, better throw it away. Or maybe your boxes are not sufficient for all the verses of scripture. And what being a Lutheran is all about is the attempt. Yeah, I'm not claiming we're perfect, but uh, scripture seems to be pretty clear on most of the issues we talk about. What being a Lutheran is all about is trying to keep all the verses of scripture in a box and having all those boxes work in harmony. Uh Also remember that it is a favorite trick of the devil to quote God's word, but to not quite quote all of God's word, right? So I'll give you half a verse or maybe a verse without its context because it sounds like it's talking about one thing, but if you look at the context, you find out it's not talking about that at all. And so if you're going to quote Romans chapter 1 as being about why baptism can't be given to infants, I got to ask you, why aren't you talking about Romans chapter 6 where it talks about baptism and what baptism does? Well, I can tell you why. You just got to look at the verse and it's really easy to see where your assumptions lie. Romans 1.16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The next verse is kind of helpful as well. It says, for in it, the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Now, not only is this not a text about baptism, what is it a text about? It's a text about faith. And for this text about faith to prove unequivocally that infants can't be baptized, you have to believe then that infants are incapable of faith. And my question would be is, okay, so where in the Bible have you found it said that the infant human being is incapable of faith? And why, even without the Bible, are you coming to this so-called reasonable conclusion? How are you defining faith that it means that it only can be had by adults or people reaching the age of accountability? And the answer to that is because you have assumed that faith is an act of the human will devoting itself towards something by choice or desire, right? And I got to ask again, where is that idea found in the scriptures? What you find in the scriptures is things like faith is the assurance of things unseen. Now, even that can be a little bit empty if you don't fill it with its context. Well, these things unseen, you can have assurance in why? Because God has spoken of them and told you what they are, what they mean, and what they will forever be. And so if we're going to have any idea about faith at all in Christianity, that faith must be in what God has said about Christianity. Likewise, then, in what God has said about what baptism actually is. And why are you saying, then, that an infant cannot be certain of things unseen if God so desires to make that infant certain of those things? Are you telling me that an infant cannot recognize its mother's voice? Well, if an infant can recognize its mother's voice, why can't it recognize the voice of God the Father who has redeemed this child, purchasing him by the blood of Jesus and promising him, I'm washing you, which is what the word baptism actually 
means. In this way, to rightly use baptism is in fact to believe what God has said about it and put our trust in it, not pit our modern, reasonable, rationalistic assumptions about faith against it, but to redefine faith not as something we choose or do, but as the receiving of God's words without choosing or doing to deny them, right? Faith is, if anything, a not responding, but a receiving alone. Now, the Acts chapter 2 text is going to make a very similar kind of point, and this is really like my favorite of the two here because it's really silly the attempt to destroy the idea without really having any basis in the text at all. Acts 2.38 says, And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now the focus here in this text is not on anything that it says about baptism, but on the word repent and the assumption that an infant can't repent, right? As if any human being dead in our trespasses and sins can repent. And here's where the real false teaching, the Pelagian idea, the belief that I can climb a ladder to God and make my salvation happen by an act of the will is at root. The assumption is that you have the power to repent and the infant doesn't. When the fact is that nobody has the power to repent, what Peter has just done has been making these people repent by preaching the word of God to them. And as a result of this fear that they express when they say, brothers, what shall we do? He says, well, believe what I've said, repent and be washed again, be baptized and you will receive. Now notice here, baptism is all about receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit. So again, why the assumption that an infant can't receive a gift from God? Why the assumption that God's not powerful enough to give his Holy Spirit to the infant? Why the ignoring of the very next verse, verse 39, which says, for the promise is for you and for your children. Right? I mean, it, he actually says it right there. It's for your children. Now, you can make the argument that, well, we don't know that those were infants. And since we've never seen an infant baptized in scripture, we can't baptize infants. And I'll just respond, okay, fine, as long as you stop communing women. Because we never want to see a woman communed in scripture. And it's never said that we have to do that. And so, you know, you're really being unbiblical because you're communing women in your church. And yeah, that's ludicrous. They've gone to plaid. Well, it's just as ludicrous to withhold baptism from people who need to be saved by Jesus' free gifts and promises, which, if you look at just what Scripture says about baptism, it always says that's what baptism is. Why is the modern individual rejecting this? Well, it's not only a matter of the rationalistic understanding that can't believe material things can do spiritual things, which would then deny that the fruit in the garden could make us fall, but let's just forget that for a minute, but then it's also pushing this Pelagian free will, willpower as salvation method of salvation, which has always been rejected by Christianity. Even the Roman Catholic Church knows to reject the Pelagian heresy. So the fact remains that in our age, you're always going to have rationalists opposing baptism. You're always going to have Pelagians opposing baptism. But if you want to know what God actually thinks about baptism, if you want your faith to be the assurance of the things unseen that are nonetheless happening in baptism, then believe what God has said about baptism in the words he writes that are actually about baptism, of which one of these texts just strictly ain't, and the other one is, and look, it mentions children. Yeah? All right, until next time, rock on. Yeah.